A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I looked over his shoulder to see the big open mouth of a nice blue forty-five, And suddenly I knew what a man feels like when he's just finished digging his own grave. Listen now to Act One of Death of an Old Flame, starring Larry Haynes and Terry Keene, and written especially for suspense by George Bamber. The name's Warren, Ronnie Warren. I play piano. I play what they call piano bars. That's where they tear the top off a baby grand and build a counter all the way around for the jerks to put their drinks on. I must have played back and forth across the country a dozen times. Never the top spots, but all the joints I worked kept the pianos to. They're running. The lady wants to hear a song. That's Leo. He owns this place. Not a bad guy, as owners go, but still an owner. I look up at the chick at the far end of the piano. She smiles. I smile, slow and shy. You know, I gave her the old cocker spaniel, like a boy fresh out of college. And she eats it up. She even wrote it out for you. Yeah, so I see. 150 a week big spender had just stumbled to the bank. I figured if she was going to make a move, she'd wait till his back was turned. She said she'd like to hear Stardust. How? Oh. Well, tell her that looks more like a telephone number to me. I think she wants you to call her. Well, tell her I never learned how to use a phone. Ronnie... She's a customer. Yeah, yeah, I know. So I smile at her again like we're both college sophomores and this is our first date. But she's a chick like any other. Poured into an expensive dress for a night on a town. A local princess who thinks she deserves better than she got. Better than a second-hand car in a garage and television every night. Better than the guy that brought her. Better than anything she'll ever have from the first moment she has it until the last moment she throws it away. For the moment... The piano player in the downtown club is better. And that piano player is me. Tell her I get off work at two. She says she can't make it. She's with a guy. Yeah, I see that, but it hasn't stopped her this far, has it? Ronnie? Leo, I've been playing saloons for ten years, and if I've learned anything, I've learned never to trust a chick and never give him an evil break. She'll be here, and I'll take her home. If something better doesn't turn up. Tell me, Ronnie, how do you do it? My boyish charm. My boyish charm. That's a joke around the salons. I'm 35 years old and I still look like I should be in college. Some guys say that's why I score so much. But really, it's the way I play piano. I play like... Like I'm in another world. And when I look up, I always smile. Like I'm pleasantly surprised that such excellent music could find itself in the presence of such superior company. I smile this way whether I'm looking at the wall, a bartender, a crying drunk, or the chick I'm working on at the moment. But out of all of them, only the chicks are flaky enough to take it personally. Why I get along without you? I don't play that number. You used to. I hadn't seen her come in. And I swung around to see what the voice told me I would find. The eyes were still incredible. So deep and brilliantly blue that you had to look twice to believe what you saw. Hello, Ronnie. She smiled. And somebody took a clean blade and dumped my insides on the floor. There was nothing left but an empty, aching hurt. I turned back to the piano because I was afraid I couldn't control my mouth. Hello, Anna. Mind if I sit down? No, no, go right ahead. I haven't seen you around the pool in a long time. Five and a half years, to be exact. I didn't keep track. Will you buy me a drink? I don't buy drinks for customers. She sat like she was suddenly very tired. And she toyed with her gloves for a moment the way she used to. Her mouth was as I remembered it. And her hair still soft and natural gold. But then I noticed there was a hole in one of the fingers of the white cotton gloves, and her dress was last year's style. I signaled the bartender to buy her a drink. Thanks. I read in the paper you were playing here. I, I kept track of you where you'd been when you'd hit town. Yeah, well, I would have kept in touch, but when I got back that night, all I could find was an empty hotel room. You didn't leave much of a forwarding address. Ronnie, I know. I, I know it was wrong. 
I've been sorry a million times. The paper never said, did you marry again? When a man said until death do you part, I figured he wouldn't have bothered to say it if he hadn't meant it. Besides, it came in handy. When a chick would scream, marry me, I'd just say, oh, baby, I'd love to, but I'm already married. Saved me a lot of scenes. How about you? No. Frankie, leave you for somebody else? No, he... He won't marry me. You still with him? Yes. Ah. Uh-huh. Ronnie, mm. play our song. Now, you heard me before. I don't play that Ronnie, song. Ronnie, please, I haven't heard it in so long. Well, I forgot how it goes. I don't believe that. Please, just once more for old time's sake. Please. That's over. Everybody gets a coffee break, including piano players. Come on, Anna. What's the pitch? You don't just run out and then pop up six years later for nothing. What do you want? Ronnie, I need help. What kind of help? Frank's flat. We don't have a cent. What do you want me to do? Loan him money? No. no. Well, then what? He knows where he can make a score. He figures if he can make one good score, we can leave town and start all over again. Maybe go to another country. What score? Frank knows where there's a half million dollars worth of furs just waiting to be picked up. It's an inside job. He'd handle it himself, except he'd be the first one they'd suspect. All you got to do is help me load the truck and drive. Now, let me get this straight. You want me to help you make a heist, risk a prison rap, so you can have enough money to take your boyfriend, Frankie, someplace else where he can live happily ever after? Ronnie, you'd get half the take. Anna, the last thing I want is your money. Ronnie, please. Look, I know I shouldn't ask you, but there's no place else I can turn, nobody else I can trust. I wanted to take her in my arms and tell her everything would be all right. Because in the heart of every cynic lie the fragments of one great dream. And in the heart of every lady killer smolders the embers of one great love. So when she said... Please, Ronnie, just this once. I said... Okay, Anna, just this once. For old time's sake. When I got to work the next night, I talked to Leo. Boss man, look, I, uh, I have some business from 10 or 12 tonight. I'd, uh, I'd like out. Hmm? It's important? Yeah, it's so important that if anybody should ask, I'd be much obliged if you'd say I spent the time sleeping off a hangover on your office couch. Okay. But let me give you a little piece of advice. Like? Like, I don't want to know. But if this important business has anything to do with that broad I saw you talking to last night, I'd watch my step. Why? That's Frankie Amato's girl. She's one of the worst rats in this town. I know. Okay, so you know. But watch yourself. When 10 o'clock came, I left the piano and slipped out the back way to a truck marked Royal Furs. Anna was sitting inside, waiting. Hi, Ronnie. She drove us across town into the back of a small shop. No one was in the alley, so she got out and opened the overhead garage door with a key while I backed the truck inside. She closed the door behind us and locked it. The furs are inside this cold storage vault. She slid back the heavy door and started stripping the hangers. It didn't take long because there weren't too many pieces. I don't know anything about furs, but I do know that what we took wasn't worth any half a million dollars. Finally, the truck was loaded and we were ready to go. But then she started pouring cleaning fluid out of cans. Look, help me spread this stuff around, huh? What for? So we can set fire to the place. Why? So we can destroy it. Frank says we have to set fire to the place to burn all the evidence. Look, you didn't mention anything about a fire before. Only I didn't because I was afraid you wouldn't go through with it if I did. Well, of course I wouldn't. Taking a few furs is one thing, but arson is something else. Somebody could get killed. We have to. Right now, Frank is playing cards with the guy that owns this place. We have to fix his alibi with the time of the fire. Oh. Oh, I see. All that matters is Frank and his alibi, huh? 
All that matters is that Frank is safe. That he's got somebody to steal for him, to lie for him, and for what? What does he do for you, Anna? Answer me. What does he do for you? Me, Come on, answer me. What does he do for you? Nothing. Now, what do you stay with him for? You happy being turned into a two-bit thief to do his dirty work for him, and for what? To lick his boots in gratitude? Are you happy, Anna? No. Then why, Anna? Why? <laughs> Ronnie, I... I don't know. If I knew, I probably wouldn't do it. I've wanted to leave him a hundred times. I don't know. Just answer me one thing, baby. Do you love him? I... I don't know. Anna, answer me. Do you love him? No. I love you. Ronnie, please. I never stopped, Anna. Every town I hit, every place I went, I walked the places we used to walk and listened to the songs we used to Honey, sing. Please don't. You don't need this, Anna. Put it down. We could cut out of here, leave this town, and never come back. No. We could start all over again, right from the very beginning, Anna. Make it like it was before, only better, a hundred times better. Mother, please, no. Look, we... We can't talk about it now. There isn't any time. Help me finish this, and then... Then we can go to some place and talk about it. No. Ronnie, please. We've got to get out of here. No, no. Help me do this, and I'll never ask you for another thing as long as I live. No, Anna. Please, Ronnie, please. <sighs> okay. I'll do it. But on one condition. What? That after we burn this place, you'll come with me and promise never to see Frank again. Well... Okay, Ronnie. I took the can of cleaning fluid from her hands and started splashing it all over the back room in a cold storage vault while she got warm and down off the shelf. We splashed more of it on the loading dock and down the hall leading toward the front of the store. And then she stopped at a door marked office. In here. Why in the office? Frank says to make sure the whole store burns. By the way, it didn't sound right to me. But I splashed the stuff all over the walls, behind the desk, the plush carpet on the floor, the papers over the desk, everything. Until the room was reeking with cleaning fluid flames, until you could hardly breathe. And suddenly, little things I'd been noticing in the corner of my skull began to hit me wrong. It just didn't add up. Until now, Anna had been as cool as a cucumber, but now she was shaking so badly she could hardly hold a can in her hands. A long coil of rope lay on the top of a filing cabinet, looking strangely out of place. And then I noticed that all the mail spread across the desk was addressed to a Mr. Frank Amato. Now, wait a minute. This is Frank's office, isn't it? Ronnie, we've got to hurry. Come on, now answer my question. This is Frank's office, isn't no. it? No. This is Frankie's office, and he wants it burned for a reason. Now, what I is it? I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, yes, you do, Anna. You know a lot more about this setup than you're letting on. Now, what is it? Telling you what you haven't doing. leveled with me all night, have you? Stay away from you me. haven't leveled with me since the night we met. Don't touch Come me. Come on, answer me, Anna. What's going on? You heard the lady. Piano player, keep your hands off. I looked over her shoulder to see the big open mouth of a nice blue forty-five, And suddenly I knew what a man feels like when he's just finished digging his own grave. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return with Act Two of Suspense. Now, from DuPont, comes the most advanced antifreeze and summer coolant ever developed for any car, new or old. Its name, Tellar. T-E-L-A-R. Tellar. It takes one and a half gallons of Tellar to protect the average full-size car down to zero. And at its new low price, your dealer can protect your car with Tellar for only about a dollar more than ordinary antifreezes, even less for compact cars. But, and this is important, once installed, DuPont Tellar can be left in all year round, summer and winter, for as long as you keep your car. Any car, new or old. Your servicing dealer will tell you exactly why this is possible. In addition, Tellar is specially recommended for modern aluminum engines. So ask your servicing dealer to install Tellar antifreeze and summer coolant in your car. Remember, it's made by DuPont. Tellar. T-E-L-A-R. Tellar. 
That's right, college boy. Keep your hands over your head. No one ever introduced us, but I'd say offhand, you're Frank. And you're bright, college boy, real bright. Now, look, if this is a shakedown, I'm afraid you got the wrong party. I'm broke. Oh, this isn't penny ante stuff. I'm going after this is money, big money. Well, pardon my density, but I still don't get it. You've had insurance, haven't you, college boy? Oh, sure, sure. But I don't see how you can collect on a store you don't own. Or do you? I don't own the store. I don't have that kind of change at present. So I insured myself. Alive, I'm not worth two cents, but dead, I'm worth 50 grand. That's quite a piece of change. And Anna here is my only beneficiary. Oh. Well, I don't know how this figures me. Unless you want me to help you commit suicide. Oh, suicides don't collect. Besides, I wouldn't die for any broad. I'd strip it for suckers like you. Okay, I've been a sucker up until now, but I don't think I can make this gig anymore, man. Nobody's going to commit suicide. I'm going to be murdered. Well, like I said, I still don't get it. I guess you ain't as bright as I thought. I told the owner of the store I was going to work late tonight, go over the books. The police will think I accidentally left the door unlocked. Somebody found it open, came in, tied me to my chair, stole all the furs, then burned the store to destroy the evidence. Now, wait a minute. In the meantime, I'll be on my way to Mexico, where Anna will join me after she's had sufficient time to recover from her grief and collected the insurance money. Well, there's only one thing wrong with that little plan, Frankie. Nobody would ever confuse me with you, not in a million years. Oh, I don't know. We're about the same height and build. You ever seen what a man looks like after he's been soaked with cleaning fluid and touched off with a match? I'm betting there's not much more than a crisp char to compare anything with. You always wanted to take my place, college boy? Sit down in my chair behind the desk and turn around and face the wall. I did as I was told. There wasn't much else I could do. But before I did, I took one last look at Anna. She couldn't face me. Hold the gun on him, Anna, while I tie him up. If he even looks like he's going to move, let him have it. Since I was as good as dead anyway, I knew that anything I did would be the right thing. They say that a man who's about to die starts praying. I didn't. I started thinking hard and fast because I wanted so badly to go on living. I don't look like I could punch my way out of a paper bag, but while I was waiting out the Army's boredom in Japan, a gentle old Japanese man taught me you don't need brawn to defend yourself, just brains and speed. And a thing called karate. Piano player's best friend, you don't hurt your hands. And I knew I had to have something to defend myself against husbands and boyfriends. So I learned karate and the art of timing and surprise. I waited until I could feel him touch my arm. And when he slid his hand down to my wrist, I made my move. I grabbed two of his fingers and heard them snap as I bent them back. That coupled with surprise made it easy for me to slip him around in a half Nelson. His fingers hanging like loose spaghetti, so his body was between me and the gun. I knew Anna wouldn't hesitate to shoot me, but I figured maybe Frankie Boy was something else. Shoot! For God's sake, Anna, shoot! I can't! Kill him, Anna! Kill him! Jed, I might hit you! All right, Anna. Put the gun down and back out into the hall. No! Go on, do as I say, Anna. I can kill him with my hands if I want to. You know that. No, Anna, You know I can do it, Anna. You've seen me practice, remember? All I have to do is add a little pressure right here. No, you've got to... Do like he says. Do like he says. That's better, Anna. I waited until she put the gun on the table and then backed clear out to the hall before I spun Frank around and slammed him with stiff fingers hard right under the breastbone. Oh! He crumpled like a rag doll with his eyes bulging like a drunk with the heaves. I ran from the office, grabbing Anna by the arm as I went. What did you do to him? Nothing, nothing. He'll live. Come on. You killed him. The only wishes I had. Come on. I dragged her all the way back to the loading dock, and she fought me every step of the way. We jumped down and ran past the truck to a small door where I struggled with the bolt all the time keeping a tight grip on her wrist. I guess I didn't jab him hard enough because Frank came out of the dock after us, doubled over in pain, his gun in his hand. Frank! Come back! Here you come back! I shoved her out the door ahead of me and dove out just as he cut loose. The shots were like matches in a gas tank. The cleaning fluid fumes made the whole building explode in a roar of flame. Ah! 
Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, we can't leave him. He'll burn alive. You can't help him, Anna. It's too late. Let me go to him. Anna, you can't go in there. Anna, no. Anna, come back. Anna. paper where my old friend Frank Amato finally met with a fatal accident. He burned to death. Ah, that so? It happened last night. I don't guess you'd know anything about it, would you? Uh, no, no. I don't guess I would. Uh, I didn't think so. The way the cops figured it, he was trying to rob the place where he worked and then burn the store to cover his tracks. And somehow he touched off the place ahead of time and burned him and the girl that was with him. That was the girl? Yeah. Yeah, probably the one that was in here last night. But they aren't sure yet. They haven't even been able to identify his body positively yet. That's too bad. Yeah. That's the way I thought you'd feel. I don't look now, but I think you've got a customer coming your way. I think I'll check the bar. Yeah, thanks, Leo. I knew what was coming. Without even looking, I knew. Do you know Stardust? I have to struggle to keep from choking. Do I know Stardust? But I don't let it show. I look up, slow and shy, and smile. And give her the old cocker spaniel. Stardust. It's a beautiful song about a beautiful girl. I was hoping you'd ask. Thank you. The pleasure's mine. I've been listening to you. You play very well. Thank you. It's been a long time since anyone said that. Most people just drink, pretend to listen. Not you. You're different. You're special. So, for a special girl, I'm going to play a special number. Not just something like Stardust. Larry Haynes and Terry Keene, and written especially for Suspense by George Bamber. Suspense is produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Special music for today's story of Suspense was composed and performed by Norman Paris. Featured in tonight's story were Ralph Bell as Frank, Robert Donnelly as Leo, and Evelyn Juster as the girl. Listen again next week when we return with Till Death Do Us Part, written by Ben Kagan. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Suspense.